So they send a party to go back to Zarahemla. And they can't find it. This is only a generation later. I'm not even that bad with directions. You know, how do you lose a city when the instructions are, go to these mountains, find the river, and follow the river until you hit the city? There are two rivers. This is the Rikalva, the Osumacinta. Doesn't quite show you there, um, but one of the things that Larry Paulson noted when he was doing some research on this is that the headwaters of those two rivers are only a mile apart in the same mountains. They followed the wrong river. They did exactly what their parents told them to do. Go to the river, follow it. <sighs> wrong river. How did they lose their hemla? Wasn't on that river. However, when you get up here, what's up there? Jaredites. It's exactly what they were supposed to find. How do you do that if you don't know this geography? How do you make that mistake so right? That is a convergence. If it were the only convergence, it would be a curiosity, but it isn't. Now, one that I think is more fun. Strange case of the anti-Nephi-Lehi's. This is, uh, two years ago I was here and I, I talked about uh, the strange case of Ammon at the waters of Cebus and uh, talked about that being a weird story. I've told that a couple of times and people really get nervous when I talk about weird stories in the Book of Mormon. And they think I'm basically disrespectful or don't like it. That first of all is not true. I love the Book of Mormon. Secondly, this is really a weird story. This one's probably the strangest story in the Book of Mormon because it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. So forget about the fact that this is a faith promoting story. Take your faith hat off and listen to the story stupid story, okay? First of all, the people of anti-Nephi decide that they're going to lay down their weapons and not fight because they claim they were all murderers. Now think about that. When did the women and children murder anybody? Even if the men were out murdering in war, and by the way, you never define murder in war. Soldiers never murder. We have to redefine it differently so that we can go ahead and do it. But when did the women and children do it? And they're saying they're all murderers. And this is a terrible thing. Next one, they bury their weapons of rebellion. Well, okay, that, that sounds interesting. They're gonna bury their weapons. Now, how many of you out there, if you had a million dollars and you buried it in your backyard and you thought you needed some of it, might go dig it up? You know, if I buried the darn thing, I know where it is. That doesn't really prevent me from doing much with it. Why is burying this thing, first of all, why to do it in the first place? And secondly, you know, why do I think that's going to do anything? You know, if I want my sword, I'll go dig the darn thing up. Okay? Now, they're extreme pacifists. So they're so pacifist, you know, so pacifistic that they are not going to take up a weapon in their own defense, and they are going to allow someone to kill them rather than to fight back. That's pacifism. That's, that's really remarkable. And these same people sent their 12 to 14-year-old sons off to war and said, see you later, kid, I'm not going, I'm not going to fight, but you, good luck. That's weird. That's a dumb story. It just doesn't happen, okay? Last one. We got there, the next two. Uh, the Lamanites, when they've finished killing all these people, uh, they decide that they still want to kill someone. They've got this bloodlust. So they take a two or three day hike off to a city and go attack them. You know, somewhere along the second day of marching, I would probably say, you know, I don't feel like killing anybody anymore. Can I go home? Can I have a hot meal? <laughs> you know? Why do you go that far away to go kill somebody? You had people right there. Okay. Next. This is the only story in the Book of Mormon where we talk about a Lamanite attack where the Lamanites don't try to dominate the city and set up a tribute relationship so that they can get economic benefit from having conquered that city. These guys go in, they just kill people and leave. But it's the only time we ever get a mention in the Book of Mormon that they take prisoners. Why toss that odd little piece in? Okay, this is where Mesoamerica comes to our, our help to tell us why this particular story sounds so dumb to us, but works in the context of this part of the world. The religion of uh, most Mesoamericans it can be summed up into the cult of war, where war is a sacred thing, and war is part and parcel of your religion. 
Um, part of this is not only killing people in warfare, but bringing people back and then sacrificing them. Now, think about the people who have claimed that they are, uh, are murderers. When did they murder? Well, they probably didn't. But if they have been converted to the gospel and they have learned that human sacrifice is probably not something that they ought to do, those people who have participated in, condoned, and experienced the religion that could, did condone human sacrifice might have a different view of how their participation would be viewed. Secondly, if their participation in the human sacrifices were distinctly related to war and that all of the feelings about that ancient religion were stirred up when they went to war, that will tell you why they didn't want to go to war, why they did not want to pick up any weapons, why that was for them the hardest thing that they were going to do because there were so many connections that were made between those actions and what they were trying to do. Next one. In Mesoamerica, it is a known procedure that people at the beginnings of new things and at the endings of certain things would cache objects, which means they would bury them. They would dig a pit and they would drop them in. The Book of Mormon does not tell us this particular detail, probably again because it doesn't need to, but most of the things that were cached were ritually broken. It is highly likely, given the context and the culture of that area, that we are talking about a cache, and the reason they couldn't go dig it up again is because they ritually broke, as an offering to God, all of their weapons as they offered their weapons to God in the earth, which was a standard practice in that area. Next, we have a war, and part of the idea of war is to obtain captives, so that's again part of what we're doing. We're going off to Ammonihah to get prisoners. And then the very last thing that we have to know is, how do you seat a new king? Well, I'll pop it up, I won't read it. Just so you get at least one Maya picture while we're in here. And I'll tell you and try and finish this off in a couple of minutes so that I can do what I told Scott I would do and end it, 12.05. The people who were coming into the city of Anti-Nephi-Lehi to take it over were doing so with the express purpose of capturing the city, removing the previous king, Anti-Nephi-Lehi, and setting up their own king. They succeeded. They did not have any opposition. Therefore, they must have been able to take over the city and set up their new uh, rule. When you have a new king, how do you install a new king? And in the Maya world, you seat them on their throne. But one of the things that you must do in order to properly seat a Maya king is you must sacrifice a prisoner captured in battle. The anti-Nephi-Lehi's didn't fight back, didn't count. So you had to do what other texts have told us that the other kings did. You go off to some unsuspecting city that's probably going to be easy pickings, but who will fight back? Fight them, get your captives, come back, install your king. In the context of Mesoamerica, this stupid story, all of a sudden, makes perfect sense. Of course it happened that way. But the only way we know why it happened the way the text tells us that it happened is by knowing where the Book of Mormon took place, by having a convergence not only of the geography into a place, but of the time, of the location, of the people, of all of these events and cultures where the text of the Book of Mormon converges with the information that we get out of Mesoamerica and not only tells us that the Book of Mormon took place there, but knowing that tells us more about the Book of Mormon than we might possibly have known otherwise. Having been through the Book of Mormon for a long time, this is the dog. We are still in the process of putting pieces together, drawing in the outlines, making sure that we have the details right. Someday, perhaps, we'll get to draw in the hair. But the dog is there. And having been through the text, having looked as carefully as I possibly can, and believe it or not, with the exact same river that I used in the paper where I came up with the idea that I didn't like the Quetzalcoatl correlation, using those same tools, those same rigor, the dog is there. And I cannot, for the life of me, unsee the dog. This is a different book than I read 20 or 30 years ago. But boy, is it fascinating, and boy, is it interesting. And I get more and more interested in it the more I learn and the more I see. And it's a much better book than I'd ever thought it was going to be. Though it is still the one thing that I thought it was, which is true. And I bear you that testimony in Jesus' name. Amen.